did the impossible. She survived. 18 years, handcuffed, held captive in a backyard by a sex offender. An all-new interview about how you turn your terror into triumph. This makes me want to dance, doesn't it? <laughs> the two daughters she gave birth to, now grown. How she feels about finding love today and the unlikely video she wants everyone to watch to understand how you can save a life. Lessons for everyone about finding joy every day. <laughs> J.C. Dugard, Freedom, my book of firsts. Welcome to a special two-hour edition of 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. It's a story of survival that stunned the nation. J.C. Lee Dugard was just 11 years old when she was kidnapped by a sex offender and held prisoner for 18 years. In 2011, two years after she was finally rescued, J.C. sat down with Diane Sawyer. She had written a book, A Stolen Life, that recounted in stark detail what she had endured during her captivity. Then, five years later, the two met again. J.C. had a new message, told in Freedom, My Book of Firsts. It was a call to action and a lesson in meeting each new day with hope. On any given day in America, you could be walking by someone whose story could change your life. See your next move. A young woman who seems to be in an ordinary happy day. You pass by, no idea what she's endured. No idea that she was once a little girl taken captive by a sex offender, held prisoner for 18 years, surviving his rages, his abuse, giving birth to two children in a hidden backyard. This was J.C. Lee Dugard when her childhood was stolen. This was J.C. Lee Dugard five years ago when she talked to me after her rescue. My world changed <laughs> in an instant. And this is J.C. Lee Dugard today. Re-emerging out of her privacy with lessons she's learned in the past five years. Thank you. About transforming suffering into joy every single day. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is my favorite. An unexpected masterclass in resilience and renewal from someone who had to learn life's toughest lessons at age 11. Look at her. It's as if time stopped. Do you feel 35? 36. I'm 36. closer to 40. Oh. <laughs> Say I look a little bit older, please. Sorry. I feel old. I feel like I've lived a lot of lifetimes, you know, and I don't really, I, I don't know, I don't really put an age to myself when you, I know, when you, when you look in the mirror, do you? Yes. You do? <laughs> no, I mean, like, when you look in the mirror, do you? Yes. Even her face, in some ways, a constant reminder okay, of the time you know, stolen from her. All those years as a captive in a predator's backyard, a prisoner inside a shed. Your skin. Mm, not, no sun for 18 years. But you said your eyes are still very sensitive mm, to light. Yeah, very, very sensitive to, to sunlight. A scar invisible to the world. Scars she says she accepts in the life she now lives with her mother and her daughters, the one she gave birth to in captivity. Well, I don't think there's anything inside me that isn't in anybody else. It's taken a lot of time and it hasn't, hasn't come overnight. You know, you have to put in the hard work and cry and for sure laugh about everything that you can. And she says sometimes you can only find the light by looking straight through the dark memories. What it was like being in the backyard. It's always there in the back of my mind. Never really goes away. The backyard, that's always how you call it? The fences. The prison backyard. There is no way to tell you about the triumph of J.C. Dugard today without taking you back. Hello? to those last moments when she was still a safe and happy little girl. An 11-year-old who loved her mom, her little sister, a cat named Monkey, and school and books and stories, and by holding on to the memory of everything she loved, survived and would triumph after a battle in a monstrous backyard. Where a convicted sex offender let out of prison early, Philip Garrido and his wife Nancy, kidnapped her, handcuffed her, imprisoned her, forced her to give birth outside. And over and over again, dozens of times, law enforcement would miss the easy opportunities to find and save her. For 18 years, she'd be forbidden to say her own name. So this is how her book, A Stolen Life, 
begins. Let's get one thing straight. My name is J.C. Lee Dugard. I was kidnapped by a stranger at age 11, and I want Philip Garrido to know that I no longer have to keep his secret. You would never know what she survived. Oh, my pine cone? Unless you notice how her well, face changes when she um, speaks of the past. And the charm around her neck, it's a pine cone. Back then, it was the last thing I touched. You know, the last grip on me. Now it's, it's a symbol of hope and new beginnings and that there is life after something tragic. It is June 10th, 1991. J.C. Dugard wakes up in this house in Lake Tahoe, California, where her family's moved because it's a safe place to live. She's in the fifth grade and remembers worrying about the field trip coming up because she's so shy, remembers dressing in her favorite all-pink outfit. And she remembers the mom she absolutely adores had to leave early for her work as a typesetter at a print house and didn't do something she said she would do. She said that she'd give me a kiss goodbye. She didn't. I wasn't mad. I just, you know, thought I'd catch her when I got home, you know, tell her, you got to give me a kiss next time, you know. <laughs> Um, she also remembers there was something she had wanted to ask her mom. I wanted to ask my mom if I could shave for the field trip. You know? Shave your legs? Yeah. <laughs> Big question Didn't want to be her. embarrassed. Yeah, yeah. Didn't want to be embarrassed. So that was the big question on my mind. She walks up the hill from the house to catch the school bus, the way her mother taught her, looking out for traffic. Walked up the side of the hill. It was the safe way to go against traffic. And um, halfway up, and I thought, oh, somebody's looking for directions. A gray car pulls up. A man rolls down the window. And his hand shoots out, and I just feel numb. My whole body is tingly. I don't know what it's from. I fall back in the bushes. She had been paralyzed by a stun gun. I lost control of my bladder. I wasn't even embarrassed. No time to be embarrassed. On the ground, she feels something with sharp edges. That pine cone. The last thing she touches before she comes to face down on the floor in the back seat of a car. I remember my throat felt very dry and scratchy and like I had been screaming, but I don't remember screaming. The man behind the wheel is that convicted sex offender and holding her down on the floor in the back is his wife, Nancy. The district attorney believes Nancy scouted the little girl for her husband as a prize. Did they say anything? Did you hear anything? No, not at first. After we were driving for a while, I heard the driver say, I can't believe we got away with it. And he started laughing. I think I blacked out again or something. It was like the most horrible moment of your life times 10. 120 miles later, this is where the car stops, a house on a neighborhood street. Garrido tells her to be quiet. I said, you know, I think it's probably one of the only things I said was my family doesn't have a lot of money. They can't pay the ransom. That's what I kidnap is ransom, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not always. He is 40 years old, 6 feet 4 inches tall, 196 pounds. She is 11. Four feet six, 80 pounds. He takes away the pink clothes she dressed in that morning. The only thing she has left is a little ring shaped like a butterfly. She will hide from him for 18 years. Um, there was a pallet on the floor. And then he said he'd be back later. And he shut the studio or the soundproof door and then the other door with the lock. You Remember heard that, that lock. <laughs> yeah. I can still? still hear it, consciously, or when I'm awake. <laughs> Just some sounds and smells and this don't leave you. He warns her there are dogs outside, Dobermans. They'll attack if she tries to escape. She notices there's one window covered with bars and a towel. He leaves. At one point, you write, you get up and you take your teeth and you pull a towel I off. I wanted to see where I was, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't use my hands, and there was just weeds and some kind of fence. Naked, arms in handcuffs behind her back, she drifts in and out of sleep. 
crying? I didn't really want to because then you can't wipe them away. You know, then you get all sticky and, you know, I mean, that sounds awful. But, you know, I tried not to cry because it, I couldn't wipe them away or, you know, and then they get itchy. And She made a note to remember the sound of the train so it would help her mother find her. And then later it was just listening to lawn mowers and airplanes, anything for human contact, I guess. I was so lonely. I, I, didn't, I felt so alone. And 120 miles away in those first hours, a mother who loves her daughter and will never give up is already on television making a plea. It's pretty young, innocent child. Friends have been searching all day and evening. Police started searching the neighborhood. Police set up a roadblock and go door to door. Her classmates are out in the streets holding up signs. And it's time that she comes home. But all alone, on that first night, J.C. Dugard decides to cling to something that will sustain her. The moonlight streaming through the towel reminds her of her mother and gets her through the night. We would always sit on the porch and we would debate whether the full moon or the crescent moon was the better moon. <laughs> I always liked the full moon and she liked the crescent. And just always made me think of her. Do you remember the song you and your mom sang? Looking at you, the moon? <laughs> I, you are the moon. How does it go? Okay. I love the moon and the moon sees me. me. I see the moon and the moon sees me. God bless the moon and God bless me. When we come back, Time a mother's search. Home. You were always there. You never left me. Parole officers, doctors who miss what is in front of them. And the story J.C. Dugard will tell for all the victims of sex abuse. A story she says is his shame, not hers. Stare it down until it can't scare you anymore. We meet up with J.C. Dugard at a ranch near her house for the past five years she's been coming here. It's a kind of unexpected training ground for building independence. There's a riot of animals of all kinds. And then down here is the barn. There are even miniature horses. The girl. Aurora is a speed freak. <laughs> After all the obedience and forced submission for 18 years, she has had to learn the basics of becoming herself, how you make choices, and the ordinary interactions of buying something at a store. You want to see Charlie? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. You too. And what about going out in crowds? That's easier. I, I prefer not crowds. Still? Yeah. She says the hardest thing to conquer is the terror embedded inside you, for instance, of strangers and what strangers can do. OK. This is Philip Garrido. In a video obtained by ABC News, he is singing one of the songs he wrote. He told everyone he was a musical genius on the verge of a big break. He also claims to be a religious visionary, calling himself the witness, rambling on about the Bible, saying he was chosen to hear the voices of demon angels in the walls, in the ground, and that he'll save the world. His first arrest was 1972 for raping a 14-year-old girl who was too afraid to testify, so the case collapsed. Five years later, he took a woman into a rented storage container and raped her for eight hours. He would be sentenced to 50 years in prison. But for some reason, the parole board decided to release him after just a quarter of that sentence was served. First week in June 1991, the 11-year-old girl, handcuffed, arms behind her back, is aching, skin rubbed raw. Philip Garrido is her only human contact, and for those first few days, he just comes, sits, tells her funny stories, brings her soda and fast food. A classic approach for a pedophile. Then one day, he brings her a treat, a milkshake. She is still in handcuffs. My first taste of, of pure you evil. Were, you knew it was pure evil at oh, some Oh, yeah. It is the first day he rapes yeah. her. I mean, maybe I didn't register that and go, oh my God, you're evil. But your body and your, you know, there's something inside of you that knows this is, this is not right. The pain, 
the abject fear. Afterwards, she remembers seeing a trail of ants make their way towards that untouched milkshake. At one point, he gives her a TV, tuned in to QVC. I would fall asleep to the sound of jewelry being sold, but at least it was talking. Her only company is a spider on the wall. She names Bianca. It was not a day that I didn't cry. I felt like there would never, ever be a day that I wouldn't cry again. Garrido threatened to sell her to other people, so she would promise to do more for him. And then, a month and a half after the first rape, he moved her to a new shed and put the stun gun out on the table where she could see it. He told her demon angels, voices in his heads, had revealed that she was supposed to help him with his sexual problems. And that you were saving other little girls. Yeah. Yeah, how stupid is that? He cuts out pornography, dresses her up in makeup, mascara, tight dresses. Snatching a little girl and then making her dress up. You know, it's all about control for these, for him, for these other freaks that do this. She has written how he smoked methamphetamine and began the 24-hour marathons of sexual abuse. I remember one night when he dressed me up. She remembers looking in the mirror. All I saw was a frightened girl who I didn't even recognize with mascara running down her cheeks and the saddest face I had ever glimpsed staring back at me. She's afraid what he'll do if he sees her tears. I did not want to provoke the sleeping dragon. Are there things from the backyard that you still can't confront, that you have not written, that you have not even allowed yourself to say? No, I've, I've let it all out because you can't keep that kind of stuff inside. It is not her shame. Those things happen to her. They're not who she is. This is J.C. Dugard's therapist, Dr. Rebecca Bailey, who says you have to stare fear in the face until it cannot hurt you anymore. She wrote again about the sexual abuse. Did you ever feel like saying to her, don't write it anymore, don't talk about it anymore, let that go? No, because I think one of the most important things of working with survivors of abduction is allowing them to have choices in every single thing they do. So I never thought she wrote too much about it or too little. I think she wrote just what she needed to do for her. What's the most haunting memory? That lock, hearing the lock. I know I, I said that earlier, but for some reason that... And the bed, it was a squeaky bed. Squeaky pull-out bed. I guess the noise, the sounds. It's weird what sticks in your head, but sounds. How did you stay sane? <laughs> I don't know. I was still alive. I was still, there was still hope. <laughs> still hope. I'm trying to imagine how you are coping. I'm trying to imagine. I don't know. <laughs> I can imagine being beaten to death, you know, but, and you can't imagine being kidnapped and, and raped, you know, so it's just, you just do what you have to do to survive. She says she is telling her story so that the thousands of other survivors of sexual abuse know that survival is your strength, not your shame. It's that T.S. Eliot quote you have in your book. Yeah, I had about hope. hope. Thinking I have to hope in something. Hope was in the wrong place. But sometimes you just have to hold on to any kind of hope to survive. When we come back, a mother moving heaven and earth to find her child and seven months into J.C.'s imprisonment. In some ways, she's just as evil as Philip. A new jailer, new fears. Very twisted minds. As we said, for seven months, the only human being J.C. Dugard would see was the man who was coming to rape her. Back home, that field trip she had worried about was long over. Back home, her fifth grade classmates have now graduated elementary school. 
Her mom is raising her little sister, feeding Monkey the cat, and asking everyone to keep searching and believing JC will return. She is coming home. That gives me a lot of hope, a lot of optimism. Somebody's, you know, feeding me dreams for a reason. And by the way, her biological father had left the family, was never in JC's life. There was a stepfather, but JC was not close to him. Two hours away, JC is now being moved back and forth from the soundproof room to the larger room where she's handcuffed to the bed. Her only company, a spider, she names Bianca. Then one day, seven months in, Garrido says there is someone he wants her to meet and he wants them to be friends. She enters the picture. Yes. Nancy. Nancy Garrido is his wife. They had met in a visiting room at Leavenworth Prison. He a prisoner there, she visiting her uncle. She a Jehovah's Witness, he talked to her about the Bible. She became his partner in the hunt for little girls. She was the other person in the car that day, the one who pinned J.C. Dugard to the floor after the two of them had stun gunned and grabbed her. Now, when she first walks in, she brings a purple bear. In days to come, a Barbie doll, chocolate milk. I was so lonely, I craved any kind of attention. I wanted her to like me. Because? Because I felt like if she doesn't like me, then I'm going to get in trouble. J.C. remembers using the cartons from the chocolate milk to try to make furniture for her Barbie. Nancy starts bringing me meals. There's a TV over there, so I could watch TV as long as it was low. She told you she, she was sorry what they'd done to you? Mm -hmm. She told me that minute. She, was, she cried, too. In some ways, she's just as manipulative because she would cry and say, I can't believe that he did this. I wish he would have got a headache that morning that he took you. And she knew everything. Yeah, she knew everything. Everything. What makes somebody do that in the first place? Take somebody else's child just to satisfy your husband. I don't know, she's just as evil as Philip. Very twisted minds. Twisted. OK, does it say record still? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. And remember the video of Philip Garrido playing his guitar? In fact, he is at a children's playground. His wife, Nancy, is holding the camera and will furtively move it off him away to gather pictures of little girls. You got me real good? Yes. I can see you really good. And don't forget, he is a convicted sex offender supposed to be monitored by law enforcement, at times even tracked by an ankle bracelet. As we said later, we will go to law enforcement and seek answers. When they are arrested, Nancy Garrido will also be charged with kidnapping and rape by force. We remember a moment from the courtroom. Philip Garrido, Nancy Garrido, in a jury box separated by their lawyers. When suddenly he looks at her and mouths the words, I love you. And like her husband, Nancy Garrido, will use manipulation on their 11-year-old prisoner alternating motherly concern with coldness and cruelty. Jealous. Very jealous of me for some reason. Like I wanted her husband to rape me. Very jealous and sick. She worked by day as an aide in a nursing home. But when Philip Garrido vanished for a month, she replaced him as jailer. A whole month, he's gone. Yeah, she said that he was on an island with a friend but he was actually sent back to prison. Only for failing a drug test. So it's the two of you. Yeah. She would lock us in every night. She wanted to watch this scary movie called The Unborn. It was awful. It was very scary. <laughs> and then she would leave in the morning and lock the door. And the two of them also worked together to use JC's love of animals to manipulate the little girl giving her kittens that would then mysteriously vanish. Well, it was Tigger, and then it was Snowy, who, I don't know what happened to her. Another kitten was named Eclipse, a girl kitten. J.C. loved so much, she asked for paper and a pen to make a little diary. She writes how grateful she was for the little kitten and how much the Garritos told her they paid for her, adding, last night I started to cry and she heard me. She came to me and sat next to me. And after that, I felt a little better. 
She means more to me than my own life. I see her love for me, and every entry is studied with a little heart on a string, like a balloon. The little kitten Eclipse would also disappear during one of Garrido's drug-filled runs. Garrido happened to notice that his captive had signed her name, J.C., on that journal. I actually wrote my name, mm -hmm. and I tore it out when because, he saw it. Because he said you had to. Yes, and that was the last time. The last time for 18 years she'd be allowed to write or speak her name. Losing her name and fighting to hold on to the memory of the face that is keeping her alive, her mom. I wanted to see her more than anything. And worried you'd forget. Worried I'd forget what she looked like or what she sounded like. Would she forget me? Would she want you after this? Yep. Yeah. Being a mom now, you know, I know that she never forgot about me because I can never forget about my kids, but... You know, when you're a kid and you think you're easily forget forgettable and... And her mother, Terry, is also fighting to hold on as one year passes, and then a second. She's alone except for her own family and friends, some of whom quit their jobs to help her. On TV, she shows JC's room untouched since her disappearance. It's where Terry says she goes to pray every night. Even though she's not here, she's still in my heart. And when 34 months have passed, 1,029 days since J.C. Dugard was kidnapped, sometimes the handcuffs would come off. Do you remember the day you weren't handcuffed anymore? I don't remember the exact day. Just all of a... I don't know if it was all of a sudden. It was over time. But she would still always be locked in a bolted room. One night, the Garridos are with her. They are watching the Ten Commandments on TV. For the first time, they bring her cooked food, corned beef and cabbage. It's Easter, 1994. And then they tell you they think you're pregnant. <laughs> yeah. Four and a half months pregnant, 13 years old. When we come back, J.C. recounts the ordeal of giving birth. You're in labor and there's nobody there. Just scared. It was terrible pain. Didn't know what was going on. And a new fear. He held her in a chair and prayed that he would never hurt her. Stay with us. Take a drive with J.C. Dugard. Happy. And somehow, everything means more. Like a room without a roof. I like that part. Me too. Like, a room without a roof is awesome. That happiness is the truth. And then, when we're on the road, we see something that seems right out of a children's story. Oh, so hot. Oh, my gosh, there's a deer. And a deer? Oh, there's oh, a baby right. oh, deer. Oh, baby. You'll have to imagine what we saw. A mother deer like a ballerina leaping across the road into the forest. Another baby deer! deer. And right behind her, two little babies joyfully vaulting okay. into the trees. That was me and my girls! Her two girls, born in that backyard, now all grown up and thriving. Five years ago, she told me about being a child herself and seeing her first baby. Did you have any idea what it meant to give birth? No, I had never seen it happen. She will have no medical care. She's bewildered by what her body is doing, and the doors to the outside are bolted. No sun, no sky. She learns the link between sex and pregnancy from TV. There was this show that he would talk about a lot, growing up baby or something like that. So I'd watch that, and he was watching birthing videos and just learned. And he said that he would read up on it, and he would do it? Yeah. August 18th, 1994, you're how old? 14. <laughs> Having a baby in a backyard. Yep, I did. She is locked in, alone, watching Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman when she feels the first sharp pain. You're in labor, and there's nobody there. I didn't know I was you're in labor, up? but yeah. I was still, yeah, locked at that time. Just scared. <laughs> it was terrible pain. I didn't know what was going on. 
hadn't seen anybody all day. She will be in labor all by herself for hours. Finally, the Garritos return. They give her codeine. The labor continues for another 12 hours, and with a complication, the baby is still inside her. Philip Garrido uses his hand to unwrap the umbilical cord from the baby's neck. He had seen that on one of the shows, that that's what you do, because she wasn't coming out. So he did that, and she came out, and then, then I saw her. She was beautiful. I, f I felt like I wasn't alone anymore. I had somebody that was mine. I wasn't alone. And I knew I could never let anything happen to her. I didn't know how I was going to do that, but I did. <laughs> And when Garrido takes the baby... He held her in a chair and prayed that he would never hurt her. Was it your terror? Yeah. Every day. <laughs> no doctors to help, no experience, no nutrition. As a 14-year-old girl breastfeeds her baby and cares for her as best she can. And impossibly, three years later in that same backyard, she will once again give birth, survive, and so will her second little girl. I have a second person to love and to love me. She now has two children locked in a room with her. She will breastfeed a total of six years straight and watches TV to learn everything she can about being a good mother. Years into her ordeal, for the first time, she will be given a tiny measure of freedom. Garrido builds a fence walling off the entire backyard and places a little tent outside. And one day, she writes, she gets to walk outside for the first time in six years. I can feel it, she writes, the sun warm on my face. And experts who study survival say nearly all those who make it through long seasons in hell find some way to create meaning no matter the reality of their day amid the trash and squalor. You planted yeah. little flowers. Yeah, I like to garden. This was your garden? Yep. Even little flowers in the tent. And she hoards the children's books they gave her. She has an idea. For her girls, she'll create a little school. We had um, math, social studies, English, and history was the other one. And uh, it's teach them the best I could. I only had a fifth grade education, so my math wasn't my strongest suit. In a secret act of defiance, she saves little scraps of paper and begins writing a journal she manages to hide from him. Sometimes it still sounds like a child. I would live in my own world and I would have superpowers, like the power to heal people and animals. Sometimes she wonders if out in the world there could be a soulmate for her. The physical abuse was all I knew. But, but things that I saw on television were so different. And, you know, I mean, I don't know. Look at this. I would search the world for the top teachers if I could get out of here. And psychologists and doctors. And I would organize and we would open a free clinic for homeless people to come <laughs> and interact with animals. I had a lot of time on my hands to think about things I would do. <laughs> Her daily life is dependency isolation, drowning in his manipulation and control, and the constant insistence for her and the girls there is only danger outside the fence in the unknown. J.C. Dugard writes Garrido often erupts with anger, inexplicable rants about her behavior, which she keeps trying to alter in order to subdue his moods. She says she had to study his rages, his demands, and writes about animals in the wild that play dead to survive. I was a predator and prey, you know, very much prey, obviously. But predator too, you know, I really had to analyze him and stay alert, like stay sane. And then one day, Garrido tells her she has to help him make Nancy feel better. So he's decided that from now on, Nancy will be the girl's mom. JC is just to be the sister. She has nothing 
of her own. She later writes in her journal, I want to be free to come and go as I please, free to say I have a family, free. Free to have my family. And next, the great mystery. Why didn't she try to escape? Did you think about taking those two girls and running? For 18 years, J.C. Dugard was held prisoner by Philip Garrido and his wife. But as you're about to see, sometimes she was hiding in plain sight. And after her release, questions would linger. Why had authorities not found J.C.? And why was she unable to help herself? Once again, here's Diane Sawyer. Why is this door locked? You are looking at a home movie the Garritos made of a parole officer going through their house. One of the 60 regular visits parole officers will make to check up on a sex offender. The voice you hear is Nancy Garrido taunting the officer. What does a parole agent do for his parolee? Ma'am, you can come in the office and we'll discuss that. As the parole officer fails to find J.C. Dugard 30 feet away. On another occasion, Garrido actually lets her into the house. She even has a casual exchange with a parole officer, not daring to say who she was. I actually talked to one of the agents, and the agent proceeded to give Philip his urine test and left. This made me feel like didn't really care. A neighbor called 911 once and said she had seen girls in his yard. Nothing was done. And so more and more years go by, summers, fall, winter. J.C. Dugard's little friends from the fifth grade are now entering college. She has been told to take a new name. Who were you? I was Alyssa. I liked the, the actor Alyssa Milano and who's the boss. And I couldn't be J.C., so I picked another name. And who were you inside when you would be out among people? Hiding. <laughs> Afraid I'm going to make a mistake and do something wrong. And no one seemed to see you? No, nobody noticed. She said by then she'd gained weight and her blonde hair had turned brown. Did you know that there was a, an artist's attempt to imagine what you looked like? What do you think? I don't think it looks like me. <laughs> when she became 17, both babies now born, Garrido's sexual interest was over, but not his hold on her. When we talked five years ago, we think you can almost see something haunting her as she looks back at who she was then. Did you think about taking those two girls and running? I'm sure I did, <laughs> but it wasn't something I felt I could do. Because? The situation felt like it wasn't an option. I don't know how else to explain it. There was no leaving. What would it have taken for you to believe you could leave? I've asked myself that question many times. <laughs> the mind manipulation, plus the physical abuse I suffered in the beginning, there was no leaving. Maybe if one of the girls were being hurt. And everyone who thinks that th that maternal impulse, which just scoop them up to run, doesn't... They were safe. I was being told that the outside world was dangerous. Uh, I couldn't ironically protect... enough, filled with rapists and yes, pedophiles. Yes, and pedophiles. I couldn't protect them out there. I, it's like what I knew was safe, the unknown that was out there was terrifying, especially when thinking about the girls. Garrido had built fences around her so much higher than the ones we can see. And even when she's in her 20s, Garrido has started a printing business and she's designing cards and invitations on a computer with internet. Her mother is on her mind, but her hands are still unable to move. He said that the computer keeps track of all that stuff and he could see that. I a couple think of clicks. A couple of clicks. But you never... I never did it. Something did. always held me back. It was like I still had those handcuffs on. Which brings us to one of the great mysteries of human behavior. 
What was the psychological stun gun that paralyzed her action, even when the doors were unlocked? Classic. Classic manipulation, being responsible for everything from time to food to human companionship. And you see it over and over again. You do see it over and over again. Her therapist, Dr. Rebecca Bailey, says what happened is a kind of coping and adaptive helplessness. It comes with years of abuse, when emotional handcuffs become stronger than tangible ones, when wielded by an expert predator. Which is why J.C. Dugar says she's on a kind of mission today to change the way we talk about victims. She's even been invited to speak at Yale and Harvard and Mass General. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is J.C. Dugard. And reminding everyone what terror does to you and how many children never make it back alive. She's outraged by a phrase used often in this country. She says the phrase implies that children cracked by terror and abuse become affectionate toward their captors. The term is Stockholm Syndrome. Is it Stockholm Syndrome? Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome, which means she developed a bond with her abductor. Bond gets deeper the longer the person's held in captivity. Stockholm Syndrome was first used in the 1970s in Sweden to describe a connection hostages formed with bank robbers there. Why do you hate the phrase Stockholm Syndrome so much? Well, it's really, it's degrading. Having my family believe that I was in love with this captor and wanted to stay with him. I mean, that is so far from the truth that it, it makes me want to throw up. You know, it's, it's disgusting. I adapted to survive my circumstances. There's just no other way to put it. What was he to you? He was always my captor. You know, there was, I never forgot that. Never forgot that. But even as J.C. Dugard was drowning in the undertow of Philip Garita's paranoia and control, she managed to cling so fiercely to her fading memories of mother, love, and hope. And look again at her secret journals, where she makes a little list of dreams for the future. First thing on the list. See my mom. See my mom. 